Beginning with 1974 models, the law requires that all automobiles sold in this country be equipped with a passenger restraint system conforming to certain specifications. In the case of cars equipped with belt restraints, in order to meet the law, the GM system is designed so that the driver and outboard passenger first sit in the car and then buckle their restraints before starting the car. The law also requires that a warning light and buzzer be activated should any of the front seat occupants have an unbuckled restraint once the car is in a forward gear or the parking brake is off on a manually operated transmission. Because GM is sensitive to your safety needs and habits, we want you to see and understand exactly how the 1974 seatbelt system is designed to work for you in all ways. And it's sensitive, too. The trick is to do everything naturally. Well, almost naturally. Just settle into your 1974 GM car. Now buckle your lap belt and the shoulder harness. Chances are you're not used to that, but the shoulder harness is permanently part of the system now. Instructions may be found on your sun visor. Go ahead, start your engine. You have done everything right, and in the right sequence. It wasn't so tough, was it? We all know there's more to driving than just moving out. The GM system knows that too. So let's talk about why the system works the way it does and some of the special provisions. Now let's take the whole sequence from the top again, this time with a passenger. Perhaps your friend isn't familiar with the GM safety system. This is a good time for him to discover how it works. You get in, sit down, and buckle up. He just gets in and waits for you to start. But the engine won't start. Why? Because your passenger forgot to buckle up. When he buckles up, then you can start your car. The new comfort clip lets him adjust to his freedom. Your friend might think that because the shoulder harness can be pulled out of the retractor, he isn't fully protected. This requires some technical explanation. You see, the GM shoulder harness is a vehicle-sensitive inertia harness. Sounds complicated, but really isn't. The inertia-type harness is designed to allow freedom of body movement. The harness locks when the whole vehicle is subjected to a sudden stop. In times of emergency, a pendulum-type switch senses the deceleration. Then, in case of mishap or in hard braking, the harness provides sufficient restraint to hold the occupants firmly in place. You really don't need a high-speed stop to prove it. There's still a lot more to know about the system. Suppose your friend wants to hop out and, say, mail a letter. He will have to unbuckle, of course, to get out. You should shift into neutral or maybe park so the buzzer won't sound. At no time does unbuckling stop your engine. When he comes back, he will then have to buckle up again before you move into a forward gear or the buzzer will sound. That's the way it works. Of course, people, because they are people, will always wonder about the exceptions. So let's go back to the beginning again. When you come to your car with some packages, you might put them on the floor in front, in the back seat, or in the trunk. This causes no problems. Sometimes, however, you may want a package up front with you. If that's your wish, put the package on the seat, then buckle the belt. Always keep the sequence right. There are still other possibilities, so let's start from the beginning once more. Maybe you have a little pal who likes to travel with you up front. His weight may well affect the system and the sequence. Follow the regular procedure, let him get in first, then buckle the belt. If he stays in place, there is no problem. Once you go into forward gear, you will get a buzzer when he moves into a front seat that isn't buckled. So just buckle the middle seat belt too. 
The middle seat belt only affects the buzzer, but it is there and part of the whole system. Whenever starting, remember the sequence must always be first the weight, then the buckles, then turn on the ignition. But let's look at a couple of other situations. This time you are alone again. There shouldn't be any difficulty. You get in. You buckle up. Everything is right. But somehow the engine doesn't start. Recheck your belts. It may be that something is wrong in the system. Don't get upset. You have an answer to the problem. Put the ignition in the on position. Then you will need to get under the hood, so you will have to release the hood and get out. You will find the bypass switch located right here. Press it. Close the hood. Get in the car. Buckle up. Then turn on the engine. If it stalls, be sure not to turn the ignition all the way to the off position. Remain in your seat with your seat belt fastened. Then turn the key again. By the way, you can't tape that free start switch down because if you do, a sensor will detect that you have and cancel out your action. Whenever there is a problem, the best thing to do is to go as soon as possible to your dealer to get the system checked. There are other exceptions we should talk about. Suppose you and your friend are at a drive-in restaurant, a movie, or a sporting event. Normally, you would turn the engine off and unbuckle to move around easily. Should you want to leave the engine running to operate your air conditioner or heater, you should put the transmission into the park position before unbuckling. In a manual transmission car, you will have to put the parking brake on. When leaving, be sure you both buckle up again before moving into forward gear. Otherwise, you get the buzzer. To start, remember the old sequence? First the weight, then the buckle. Toll booths can cause a little movement too. Best to have your money ready. If you do have to unbuckle to raise up and get change out of your pocket, put the transmission in park or neutral so you don't activate the warnings. In a manual transmission car, you will have to put the parking brake on. Sure, the system is new and different, but it is protection. Protecting those whom we love is natural, and this is one way to do it. First, put him on the seat, then buckle him in. Now do the same thing yourself. Research indicates that restraints such as this can save thousands of lives and prevent a good deal of injury. It is hard to avoid human error, but this restraint system can help you protect yourself and those you love. van should be easy to handle, offer driver visibility, and be easy to park. Its cargo should be easily accessible from the front, from the side, and from the rear. Everything about a van, from its basic design, including its overall length and interior roominess, to the ruggedness and dependability of its suspension components, to how much it weighs and how this weight affects its cargo-carrying capacity, and to how easy it is to service, 
All these factors affect a van's operating efficiency and economy and its lasting value. These are the critical van characteristics that formed the basis for the Chevrolet design. Let's compare Chevy van, proven in over four years of design refinement, with Ford's new Econoline. Econoline has a new body and frame design and a new nose that extends three feet forward of the door frame. The front axle has been moved forward 14 and a half inches and 18 and a half inches on the two wheel bases. The engine has been moved forward all resulting in longer wheelbases, longer outside length, heavier empty weight, and less interior room than comparable Chevy vans. Chevy vans are offered in three series and two wheelbases, 110 inches and 125 inches. Econoline vans are offered in four series and two wheelbases, 124 and 138 inches. Here's Chevy's best-selling van, the G20, on a 125-inch wheelbase, which has a longer load length than Ford's most comparable model, the E150 Econoline on a 138-inch wheelbase. This Econoline has a 13-inch longer wheelbase, is almost 6 inches longer in overall length, yet the box dimensions of both vans are approximately the same. The G20 Chevy van has a 100 pound advantage in maximum GVW rating. But more importantly, Chevy van's curb weight is 313 pounds less than the E150 Econoline. Less curb weight is an advantage when operating empty and it allows larger payloads. From the gross vehicle weight rating, subtract the curb weight of each van and the G20 Chevy van has a 413 pound carrying capacity advantage. This means that, in this example, the G20 Chevy van, because of its higher maximum GVW rating and lower curb weight, can carry 413 pounds more people and cargo. Chevy van's lower curb weight and greater cargo carrying capacity are a result of its unitized body. It's a lightweight yet sturdy structure with an integral body and frame welded together for strength and durability. Econoline uses a ladder type frame and a bolt-on body. This added weight built into a van not only reduces its cargo carrying capacity, it also takes fuel to pull that extra weight around. Sometimes what a van can carry is more important than how much it can carry. These 14 and a half foot sections of pipe fit easily into the G20 125 inch wheelbase Chevy van. Even with a 13-inch longer wheelbase and almost 6 inches longer overall length, this Econoline's maximum cargo length is 5 and a half inches shorter. From the rear of the seat to the rear door at the floor, Econoline is almost 3 and 1 half inches shorter, at the belt line over 5 inches shorter, and from the engine cover to the rear door over 3 and 1 quarter inches shorter than Chevy van. Inside, Chevy van is over an inch wider than Econoline between the wheel housings and over an inch and a half wider at the belt line. Racks and bins from Chevy vans produced since 1970 are still interchangeable, an important consideration for fleets, utilities, and trades. Because of design changes, racks and bins from previous Econoline models may require alterations. One door loading is a time-saving convenience, but this protruding lock striker bolt in the Econoline could be a nuisance or cause cargo damage. Chevy van's rear door opening measures almost one inch higher and over an inch and a half wider than Econoline's rear door opening. Chevy van's standard sliding side door opening measures over 49 inches high and over 44 inches wide. Econoline's available sliding side door is over an inch lower, over three inches narrower, and the 58 pounds it adds to the curb weight of the vehicle further reduces its cargo carrying capacity. Chevy van offers five engines, two six cylinders and three V8s. Econoline offers only one six cylinder and two V8s. 
With Econoline's new extended nose, the service check access is now up to the general standards of Chevy van. But inside, Econoline's engine cover is four inches wider than Chevy vans. As a result, Econoline's driver foot area is more crowded, less comfortable than Chevy van. In Chevy van, both the driver and passenger seats face directly forward. Econoline's passenger seat is angled outward, and there's also less room in the Econoline's passenger foot area. Chevy van owners benefit from a number of long-lasting value features. Ask your Chevy salesman to explain the benefits of Chevy van's massive girder beam independent front suspension, shielded front shock absorbers, staggered rear shock absorbers, lining wear sensors on G20 and G30 series front disc brakes, finned rear brake drums, high energy ignition system, and Elpo electrocoating body corrosion protection. Then, drive Chevy van and compare the benefits of its more compact design, shorter overall length, and its impressive maneuverability and ease of handling. In addition to Chevy van, ask your Chevy salesman about high cube vans with steel or aluminum bodies. Chevy cutaway vans, designed for economical conversion into a wide range of applications. And Chevy step vans, also available in steel or aluminum bodies with up to 717 cubic feet of cargo capacity. Yes, Chevrolet offers an unsurpassed selection of vans and they all deliver lasting Chevy value.